This is the first video in a series devoted to a course on introductory proof writing. So this is generally a course that you might take when studying mathematics just after taking the calculus sequence. Perhaps you've also taken something like linear algebra. So we're essentially covering the material from this great book that I like called The Book of Proof, which is free and open source. You should be able to find it in the link below. Okay, so let's jump into it. So we'll start with the definition of a set. So we're starting pretty basic and actually we're going to look at some mathematical structures before we start writing proofs. And th that's just so that we're, we're familiar with enough things that we can write proofs about. Okay, so a set is a collection of objects and those objects are known as elements. And the important thing here is the elements can really be anything we'd like. They could be numbers, they could be letters, they could even be sets themselves. And so let's look at some basic examples. So this would be the set containing three, four, and five. So that's a set with three elements and each of the elements are numbers. You could have the set of all words in the English language. So some things inside of that set are like the and blue and tree and so on and so forth. The important thing about these two sets is they're both finite. So this one is clearly finite. It has three elements, but there are only finitely many words in the English language. Perhaps that number is quite large, but it is finite. We could also have the set containing one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, so on and so forth. So we'll later call that the natural numbers or the set containing all real numbers. And those are both infinite sets. They have infinitely many elements. So already we see two different types of sets, sets containing finitely many elements, so finite sets and sets containing infinitely many elements, infinite sets. And then a quick non-example would be the collection of all sets. So in other words, there's no set containing all sets, but that's like some higher end set theory, which we won't get to in this course. And so let's go back to our definition and notice that sets are made up of elements. Now we'd like a shorthand to describe this relation of being an element of a set. And that shorthand will be this symbol here. So it's kind of like an E, but I just call this the element symbol. And I think that's what most, most people would call it. So this we would say A is an element of capital A. So there it is there. But you could also negate this statement as well. So this says that X is not an element of the set capital A. And in fact, this symbol can be written in any direction you like. So here we have A as an element of A, like written backwards. But sometimes that might read like this. A contains the element little a. And that's just because we're reading it from left to right. Now let's look at a quick concrete example using this notation over here. So let's take our set A to be the set 1, 3, 5, 7, 9, 11, so on and so forth. So that's going to be all odd positive integers or positive whole numbers. Now let's notice we could say something like this. 1, 3, and then 121 are all elements of A. So this means that 1 is an element of A, 3 is, and 121 is as well. Well, let's notice there are some things that are not elements of A as well. So one half is not an element of A, two is not an element of A, and 240, they are all not elements of A. So now let's look at some important sets which we'll see over and over again. So the first is called the empty set. And so we denote it by this symbol or less commonly this symbol where we've got curly braces and nothing inside. The important thing is that there's nothing inside. In fact, the empty set contains no elements at all. Then a next important set would be maybe the natural numbers. And so that includes all positive integers, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, so on and so forth. Sometimes that includes zero depending on who you ask. But I think mostly for this course, we will have it not include zero, just for the sake of argument. 
Then we've got the integers. That's all positive and negative whole numbers. And then the number zero. So like negative two, negative one, zero, one, two, so on and so forth in both directions. The next we could have the rational numbers. So that's gonna be all ratios of integers. So they're of the form P over Q where P and Q are integers and Q is not zero. Then you could have R, which is all real numbers. In order to carefully construct the real numbers, it's actually pretty tricky. You might learn that in a real analysis class like in the future. Then you've got the complex numbers, which are of the form A plus BI, where A and B are real numbers. And then I is, of course, the imaginary number. So when you square it, you get negative one. Okay, so moving on, if we just look at finite sets for a little bit, we've got this natural thing, which is the number of elements in the finite set. And we'll call that the cardinality of a finite set. So to define it, the cardinality of a finite set is the number of elements it contains. And let's say A is a set with five elements, then we would write it like this. So it looks like absolute value of A equals five, but since we're thinking of A as a set, we would write, read that as the cardinality of A is five. Now I've seen other textbooks that use this number symbol, like this number symbol is a function acting on the set A, and it gives you the number of elements inside of A. So there are probably some more notations as well that you might want to look out for depending on which textbook you're reading. So let's look at some examples of sets with different cardinalities. Let's start by noticing that the cardinality of the empty set is zero. And that's because it has zero elements. That's the definition of the empty set. But if we take the cardinality of the set containing the empty set, we get the number one. Because this set contains a single element. That element is the empty set. So it's a little bit tricky, but let's recall that elements of sets can be sets. So let's look at maybe a simpler one. What about one, two, seven, 100? So that set contains four elements. Well, let's look at another one. Let's make it a tricky one this time. So the cardinality of the empty set and then the set containing the empty set and then the set containing the empty set and the set containing the empty set. So our goal is to find the cardinality of that set. But the cardinality of that set is three. So let's notice it's three elements are the empty set, the set containing the empty set, and then finally, this set containing both the empty set and the set containing the empty set. So we have three elements. So that means, like I said, its cardinality is three. Now, what about this? What's the cardinality of the set con of the set containing the real numbers and the integers? Well, the cardinality of that is two. So the real numbers itself is an infinite set. The integers is an infinite set, but we're not asking the cardinality of the real numbers or the cardinality of the integers. This is the cardinality of the set containing each of these two sets. But that's all this larger set contains are those two sets. But that means that the cardinality is two. That set has two elements. It just happens that each of those elements are infinite sets. Okay, so let's move on. Now we're gonna look at some succinct ways to write down sets without listing all of the elements. And that's called set builder notation. And in fact, we've already used it to describe both the rational numbers and the complex numbers before. So it goes like this. So you'll have two curly braces kind of building the whole thing. And then you'll have this thing broken by a vertical line or sometimes a colon depending on the author. And we have it like this. On the left-hand side of the vertical line is an expression. And on the right-hand side is a rule satisfied by that expression. And this vertical line or the colon is the word such that. So you read this as the set containing this type of expression such that this expression satisfies a certain rule. Sometimes you do something slightly different and it goes like this. 
So on the left hand side you have the broad shape of an element and on the right hand side you have specific rules that element must follow. Okay, so let's look at some examples. And we're actually going to look at some of the same sets written with set builder notation in different ways, for a couple of these at least. So let's say we've got 2 times n, where n is an integer. So that would be one way of describing a certain set. So notice we've got n is an integer over here. And then we've got 2 times n over here. That means our elements look like 2 times n as n runs through all integers. Now we can easily see that this means this is all even integers. And then well, we can list all even integers with some dot dot dots to recognize that there's some pattern here. So maybe this would be dot 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 minus 6 minus 4 minus 2 0 2 4 6 dot dot dot. And I think that's clear that we're listing all even integers. So what are some other ways to write this down? Well you could write it like this. You could say we've got all elements in which come from the integers satisfying the rule that n is even. So that would be more in line with this second way of using set builder notation. Next, we could translate this phrase n is even, or maybe it's a sentence n is even, into something that looks more mathematical. It's not really more mathematical, but it's got some symbols, and that would look like this. So this would be the set containing all integers n, such that n equals 2k for some integer k. That would be another way of describing all even integers. So all even integers are most definitely multiples of two. That's the definition of an even integer. So that's why this works. So let's look at some other examples. So let's look at the set of all real numbers x such that x squared equals two. Okay, well that's just going to be all solutions to the equation, the polynomial equation, x squared equals 2. I think probably from a pre-calculus class we know that this is negative square root of 2 and positive square root of 2. So this is a set containing two elements. Now what about this? What about the set of all rational numbers x such that x squared is 2? Well, famously, the square root of 2 is not a rational number. We'll prove that later in the course, but you probably know that fact already. So that means no rational number will satisfy this, which means, in fact, we have the empty set. This is just a really fancy way of writing the empty set. So let's look at a couple more. Let's look at all integers z such that the absolute value of x is less than 3. So that means x has to be between negative 3 and positive 3, but it's not allowed to include 3. But we're also only looking at integers. So this boils down very quickly to the set negative 2, negative 1, 0, 1, and 2. If we take the absolute value of everything within that set, we get something smaller than 3 for sure. But everything outside that set, we would get something bigger than or equal to 3. So let's look at a companion to this. Let's say we've got all real numbers satisfying the, e, the inequality absolute value of x is less than 3. Well now we would generally write this in interval notation, something that you probably learned in calculus or pre-calculus, and I would write this as the open interval negative 3 to 3, just keeping in mind what I mean by that is the portion of the real line between negative 3 and 3, not including negative 3 or 3. So now let's look at some operations we can do between two sets. Now we're going to look at a way to take the product of two sets. So given two sets A and B, we'll define their Cartesian product by the following new set. So we'll call it a cross b, and it'll be the set of all ordered pairs a and b, where a comes from a and b comes from b. Now the important thing here is that a and b don't have to be the same type of set. You could have a be the set of all real numbers, and b be the set of all vegetables in your fridge. So an example of a something in a cross b here would be like the number 5 and broccoli. 
Um, and then maybe something else would be like the number pi and a pi. So most of the time, both of these will be sets of numbers, but I think it's like a fun example to think about, well, what happens if they're not both sets of numbers? So here's a nice visualization, and this harkens back to thinking about this like the real plane. So let's say we've got a set A. It has two elements, U and V. And then we have a set B, which has three elements, X, Y, and Z. Then we could write... Then we could lay A across a horizontal axis and B across a vertical axis. And then everything in A cross B will be ordered pairs made up of elements of A and elements of B. So this would be A cross B. So for instance, U comma Z, V comma Z, U comma Y, V comma Y, U comma X, V comma X. Those are the six elements of A cross B. And in fact, something that we won't prove right now is that if A and B are finite, then the size of A cross B is the size of A times the size of B. Okay, so now let's look at some visualization examples of cross products. So let's start with R cross Z. I think this is a nice example. So this is living within the Cartesian coordinate plane. Notice the Cartesian co coordinate plane is just R cross R, or sometimes we write R cross R as R squared. We'll see that later. So it's gonna be a subset of this plane. And what subset will it be? Well, notice that each first coordinate can be any real number, whereas each second coordinate can be just any integer. So notice the x-axis is definitely a member of this set. And that's because the first coordinate is a real number x and the second coordinate is the integer zero. Maybe I'll underline this in yellow just to show that we're graphing this in yellow. You could also maybe have this portion right here, which would be of the form, maybe we'll say y comma one we could have something down here, which is y comma negative one or real number comma negative one. We could have something up here, which would have a second coordinate of two. Down here would be a second coordinate of negative two and so on and so forth. So it's this infinite co collection of lines. Okay, so let's look at a next one. Let's say we've got n cross n. So again, that naturally lives within the Cartesian coordinate plane, r squared, which is r cross r. So we might as well write it as a substructure of that larger structure. So notice here, all of the first coordinates are natural numbers and all of the second coordinates are also natural numbers. So we would have like one comma one, that would be an element. And then maybe two comma one, three comma one, four comma one, five comma one, six comma one, and so on and so forth. We could also go this way. So this would be one comma two, one comma three, one comma four. And as you see, we're filling in all of these points. So this is some sort of like lattice and it's going infinitely in both directions, including like up like that. So that would be N cross N. Now let's look at another one. Let's look at maybe Z cross the half open interval one to three. Let's say it includes one, but it does not include three. So this is a substructure of the real numbers. So what would that look like? So notice all of the first coordinates are integers. All of the second coordinates are real numbers between one and three. So that would be something like this. So we could go here to one, up to here to three, and it would be that. So this would be like zero comma x, where x comes from one comma three. But then this first coordinate can be any integer like we pointed out. So it could be one, two, three, four. It could be negative one, negative two, negative three, negative four, so on and so forth. So pushing that out, we've got this like infinite collection of half open line segments, which are all parallel to each other like that. So that would be an example of that set. Okay, let's look at one more. Let's maybe look at the set 
one, two, three, cross the set negative one, zero, one. So again, we'll put this in the Cartesian coordinate plane, but this is only going to have nine elements based off the fact over here, which we're not proving just yet at least. We'll prove it later. So notice the first coordinates can be either one, two, and three. The second coordinates can be negative one, one, or zero. So here would be the fact when the second coordinate is zero, you would get those three points. If the second coordinate is one, you would get those three points. If the second coordinate is negative one, you would get those three points. So we get those following nine points. So one of the important things for each of these is that we drew them all as substructures of the real plane R2 or R cross R. So that really motivates us to define what it really means to be a substructure or a subset. So let's do that. So if we've got two sets A and B, we say that A is a subset of B if every element of A is an element of B. And we'll write like this, A is a subset of B. But there is some contention among math people whether or not we should have this line down here. I'm really agnostic on it. I don't care one way or the other. But sometimes people use A as a subset of B without the line down there. And sometimes this means that B cannot just be all of A. So B has some elements that don't contain A. Or sometimes these two symbols can mean the same thing. Sometimes if you want to really hit home that A does not contain all of the elements of B. In other words, B has some things that are not in A. You would write it like this. So A is a subset of B, but a proper subset. So you'd put a cross in so you'd put a cross through that line. <clears throat> but all of these notations vary. So you just have to think on, but you should be able to pick up by context which the book you're reading is using. Okay, so let's look at some examples. So if we have any set A, well, we automatically know two subsets. And one of those subsets is the empty set. So the empty set is a subset of A. And the set itself is also a subset of A. Now, you might think that this means that every set has two subsets, but that's totally not true because the empty set only has itself as a subset. So, and that's because A would be equal to the empty set in this case. Then we also have this nice string of numerical subsets. So we've got the natural numbers as a subset of the integers, which is a subset of the rational numbers, which is a subset of the real numbers, which is a subset of the complex numbers. And in fact, you can push that way if you want to the quaternions and other more obscure things if you're psyched. You can also maybe look at this. So the set containing negative one, zero, one is a subset of the closed interval from one to, or from negative one to one. You could also maybe look at the set Z cross R as we saw in a picture previously, and that will be a subset of R cross R, which is sometimes called R squared or R2. And now all of this really brings us into an important definition, which will fit in here, and that is the set of all subsets. And that's called the power set. So the power set of a set A is the set of all subsets of A. And we denote it with the following notation. We've got this calligraphic P of A. So we read that as the power set. That opens us up to some more examples. So the power set of the empty set is simply the set containing the empty set. So let's recall up here, if A is any set, then the empty set is a subset and that set is a subset. Well, in this case, those two overlap. Then we could have the power set of the singleton set X. So let's just a set containing a single element, we'll call it X. 
So that's gonna be the empty set, and then the whole set, the singleton containing X. Then we can move on, maybe the power set of the set containing A and B. So that's sometimes called the doubleton, a set with two elements. So this one's a little bit more interesting. You would have the empty set, that's a subset. You would have the singleton A, the singleton B, and then the whole set A and B. Great. And all of this brings us to a fact, a fact that's pretty similar to the fact that we saw with the Cartesian product on the size, and that would be the size of the power set of A is two to the size of A, or the cardinality of the power set of A is two to the power of the cardinality of A. And right now this only makes sense for finite sets, but in fact, you can make some meaning out of this for infinite sets if you want to maybe dive deeper. Well, let's maybe check this in these two examples, or three examples. So here we've got the empty set that contains zero elements. Two to the zero is one. The power set has exactly one element. What about this? This set contains one element, but the power set contains two elements. That's two to the one. This set contains two elements, but the power set contains one, two, three, four elements, that's two to the two. So this fact seems to hold for these basic cases, but we'll prove that it holds um, in general later. Okay, so that's about enough for this first video. I'll leave you with some warm-up exercises. So here are two warm-up problems, each with a couple of parts to work on based off what we saw today. So the first is to list the elements of the following sets. So these are given in set builder notation. So first we've got all integers x such that the absolute value of 7x is less than 24. Next we've got all real numbers x such that 7x squared minus x cubed equals 12x. Finally, we've got all capital X inside the power set of the set containing one, two, three, such that the cardinality of X equals two. Then next up, we've got some subsets of the plane to sketch. So the first is everything of the form X comma X plus Y, where X is a real number and Y is an integer. Next, we've got the doubleton zero, one, so the set containing zero and one cross the half open interval zero to one, not including one. Then next we've got the close interval one to five cross the set containing all ordered pairs X and Y from real numbers such that X squared plus Y squared equals one. So this last one is interesting because it's three dimensional and that's a good place to stop.